بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم جی اسٹوڈینٹس آئی ویلکم یو آر ٹو دا نیکسٹ سیشن آف کلینکس لیکچر سیریز ٹوڈے وی آر گوئنگ ٹو ٹاک اباؤٹ اے ویری فیمس ٹرم اینڈ دیٹ از بوٹنگ پروسیس آف این آپریٹنگ سسٹم وی آل نو دیٹ این آپریٹنگ سسٹم مسٹ اٹ سیلف بی لوڈیڈ ان ٹو میموری اینڈ اٹ مسٹ بی رننگ بفور اے یوزر کین لوڈ اینڈ ایگزیکیوٹ ڈفرینٹ پروگرامس آف ہز اور ہر چوائس The details of uh, this booting process may vary depending on the hardware platform and operating system. But roughly we can uh, describe uh, this booting process into these five phases. The first is the BIOS or UEFI. The basic input-output system is now replaced by unified extensible firmware interface. Let me change the color. So this performs uh, a test that is known as the power of power on self test. And then as per the prioritized boot order mentioned in the CMOS, it selects the appropriate boot disk to execute the MBR. So the basic task is of course post and then to hand over control to the master boot record. Well the master boot record usually resides in the zero sector of zero sector of the boot drive. And this is also called the stage one bootloader. Stage one bootloader. So the master boot record hands over control to another program which is known as Grub in Linux, of course. Grand Unified Bootloader. This is the default bootloader of Linux which is responsible for loading the kernel into memory. So the main task of Grub in Linux is loading the Linux kernel into memory. Once the Linux kernel is loaded into memory, this kernel initializes itself initializes itself then it loads the famous initial ram disk image initial initial ram disk image And this initial RAM disk image contains a temporary file system with different loadable kernel modules that are used to load the actual or the permanent root file system. And after the actual permanent root file system is loaded inside the memory, the kernel hands over control to another process that is known as the system daemon. The kernel actually forks the system daemon, forks and executes a process that is known as system d which is the granddaddy of all user space processes it is also called init in the previous versions and this system daemon then execute different user space uh, processes and it executes different scripts to bring the system in an, uh, uh, a default state which is normally normally the graphical dot target graphical dot target and maybe multi user dot target and maybe rescue dot target and thus giving a user interface to the user of the computer to interact with it so this is a brief overview of the linux booting process and system initialization and before i go into the details of each of these tasks uh, 
let me give you a, a brief overview of the hardware. Right, uh, this diagram is taken from the web page of Gustavo that describes how an Intel computer is wired up nowadays. You can see the Intel CPU core to QX6600 over here. And you can see that uh, this CPU is connected with a North Bridge chip on, on the motherboard. This North Bridge chip is also normally called the memory controller. Because this is mainly connected with the RAM modules and is also connected with the uh, graphic cards of yours. The CPU is plugged onto this motherboard using pins, different pins. And it communicates with the outside world via these pins. Therefore, the CPU do not care what the outside world is. May it be a motherboard as shown over here, may it be a network router, may it be a toaster, a washing machine, or maybe a brain implant. As far as uh, this core to 6600 Intel processor is concerned, it uses 33 pins to transmit address. So that means it can address 2 power 33 different locations. It uses 64 pins for sending and receiving data. That means it can send 8 bytes of data at a time and it can receive 8 bytes of data at a time. So that means it can handle about 2 power 33 into 8 bytes which is equivalent to almost 64 GB of memory. Students, most of the requests of uh, the CPU are routed to RAM by the North Bridge, but some addresses are also mapped to the attached devices like, like the USB ports, the serial AT ports, and, and of course, the BIOS flash memory, which we are interested right now. In Linux, this routing is divided, uh, is decided rather, via a memory address map. And if you are interested to see this uh, map, you can view the contents of the file inside the proc directory. You can use the cat command and see the contents of the file iomem. This will show you all, 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 the, all, all the memory mappings that is done by, by the Intel machine. So with this overview of, of, of the motherboard chipset, we move on to the first stage of a booting process that deals with what we call BIOS. So uh, things start rolling when we press the power button of our computer. Once the motherboard is powered up, it initializes its own firmware, the chipset which we have just seen and the other tidbits which are attached to it and tries to get the CPU running. Right, student, uh, in today's computer, we have multi-core or multi-processor systems, multi-processors, which are attached to the motherboard. Out of these many cores or processors, the system chooses one of the processor as the bootstrap processor, BSP. And all the remaining processors are called the application processors. The application processors remain halted until later they are explicitly activated by the kernel. Until that time, the booting process is conducted by what we call the bootstrap processor. And you need to remember that the bootstrap processor at this stage is in real mode uh, with memory paging disabled. Okay, 
Now we have a, a famous register that is the EIP, the instruction pointer. And until CPU processors, this register holds a magical address that is called the reset vector. It contains an address that is known as the reset vector. And for all x86 processor, this is this is this address. This address. 16 bytes below uh, the 4 GB. So instruction at this address is a jump instruction. You can see the instruction over here. This is a jump instruction and that jumps to, to a location that is 0xf0000. So we move on to, to this place. And over here, this is the place under 1MB real mode which is the BIOS entry point. This is known as the BIOS entry point. And it is now that the uh, bootstrap processor starts executing the BIOS code. The BSP executes the BIOS code. And remember, this is the BIOS code over here. And what this BIOS code actually do is, and the famous power on self test. Test various hardware components attached. And if uh, there is no video card or no memory card available, this causes the BIOS to emit different beep codes. Repeated long beeps, for example, indicate the memory problem. And once it detects a working uh, video card, uh, the errors are displayed on the screen. For example, if the video card is detected and there is no keyboard, you normally you normally see a message on the screen. After the post is done, the BIOS wants to boot up an OS. Locates. Uh, Okay, it's for uh, booting device. And, and that booting device can be a attached hard disk. That can be a USB flash. That can be a disk, optical disk. And that, that may be a machine on a network. Now the booting device can be any one of these. However, the BIOS code is permanent and here comes the complementary metal oxide semiconductor, a battery powered, a battery powered memory chip on the motherboard. And this contains the prioritized boot order in, which can be altered, of course, by the user if desired. So CMOS con contains the priority of the booting devices. And the default is normally your hard disk. And if the default is the hard disk, what the BIOS do is, BIOS reads the zero sector. First 512 bytes of the hard disk to load the contents into memory. Uh, and these contents, first 512 bytes contents are loaded into memory at address 0x7c double zero and up till now the the this portion is done the bios is done and before i proceed on to the next stage let me talk a bit about uefi uefi stands for unified extensible firmware interface it is either 32 bit or 64 bit and it is fastly replacing the old uh, legacy uh, bios software so after BIOS is done, we move on to the next stage and that is the master boot record. Well, we have talked about the master boot record in some uh, previous session as well. If you haven't gone through that session, you, you please go through that session so that you can understand this properly. Well, the contents of uh, 
the zero sector are over here this is a linear view of the hard disk this is a zero sector this is sector one sector two sector three and so on the, these are uh, the different sectors of the disk shown in a linear view the contents of the zero sector of hard disk that is 512 bytes contains the code that is known as the stage one bootloader this is known as this contains the stage one stage one bootloader this can be linux specific can be windows specific and it can be even a virus please note that the mbr is not located inside any partition rather precedes the first partition and here is the 440 bytes of code which is the actual mbr then we have four bytes of disk signature two bytes null bytes and then we have uh, four 16 bytes entries of 64 bytes in total that deals with the partition table and then finally we have 2 mb uh, boot signature okay so uh, in the previous session as well we have seen uh, different commands that can be used to see the contents of the the 440 bytes of code and the disk signature and and this uh, let me move on to to the terminal if okay now we need to see the command to uh, view the mbr signature so the command to view is dd if input file is equal to div sda bs is equal to 512 that means at a time i want to read a block of 512 bytes uh, count is equal to one that is i do it only once and then let's suppose hex dump hyphen c probably we have seen this command before as well so i just want to see uh, the initial let's suppose 440 bytes i just want to see the code so this is the code let me shrink it so this is the code that we have seen before as well this is the portion of first 440 bytes of of the zero sector And if uh, I, I suppose just want to see the MBR signature and that is there in the last two bytes of uh, the uh, zero sector, then probably I just need to write down 512 over here, count is equal to one. And then I want to see the tail hyphen C, just two bytes. And I want to see the hex stamp okay so 55aa uh, this is the mbr signature that is located in the last two bytes of the zero sector and if i want to see the disk signature that is the that is uh, these four bytes over here so i can repeat this command with 446 over here 446 will take me to this place and the last two bytes uh, last four bytes i will like to like to see last six bytes till uh, six bytes hex stamp again okay so these are the last two null bytes as mentioned over here last two null bytes and 69cc354b this is what uh, the disk signature is so well gentlemen this uh, piece of code this 440 bytes of code uh, is the master boot record code and this cannot load the entire kernel you cannot load the entire kernel using the code that resides over here as this is unaware of the file system concepts and it requires uh, requires uh, a proper bootloader with file system drivers so this 440 bytes of code is actually used to load the actual actual bootloader so this is used to load the actual bootloader so uh, let me move ahead to the next board and let me talk about the bootloader now the question is what is uh, what is a bootloader 
let me say a bootloader bootloader is the first software program that runs when a computer starts when a computer starts so a bootload is the first software program that runs when a computer starts and different operating systems have a support of different bootloaders for example for Linux if I talk about Linux we have uh, LILO the Linux loader we have grub the grand unified bootloader also called the grub legacy now and now the famous grub2 and this this grub2 is used to by the most uh, latest linux distribution and it can uh, load all distribution of linux it can load bst unix mac os and it can also use uh, used to load the disk operating system as well and if we talk about the windows operating system the default loader of windows is ntldr a new technology uh, loader and remember it it cannot load Linux however we do have load lin bootloader that runs under DOS and that allows Linux system to be loaded but only for uh, Windows 95 98 and Windows me now we are going to talk about the grub 2 over here the three stages of grab2 the first is the stage one we have already seen uh, the 446 bytes boot dot image the 446 bytes code is normally known as the boot dot image which is stored in the MBR it is configured to load the stage 1.5 bootloader stage 1.5 uh, this is a 30 KB code that is known as core dot image and if you talk about the linear view of the disk after the MBR 512 bytes of MBR it is located somewhere over here 30 KB and this 30 KB is before the first partition this doesn't reside inside any partition uh, and this space is basically used to store file system drivers and loadable kernel modules that are called LKMs and 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 these enable state 1.5 to load the stage 2 bootloader the stage 2 bootloader so inside grub uh, we can divide it into three parts stage 1 stage 1.5 and stage 2 to describe the stage 2 bootloader let us uh, move on to a terminal let us move on to a terminal and see what all files that belong to grub stage 2 uh, let me move on to the, the boot partition I'm inside the boot partition and, and if I do ls you can see a lot of files over here uh, the first file I want to show you is VM Linus this is a compressed bootable kernel image then there is another corresponding file that is init rd dot image this is initial RAM disk uh, an early root file system that allows kernel to get essential device drivers the loadable kernel modules to get the final root file system then we have uh, the system.map file which is the symbol table that is used by the kernel then we have the config file that is a file containing configuration parameters for the Linux kernel students if you happen to have multiple kernel versions available you may find these four files for all versions 
as right now I am having two kernel versions 4.6 and 4.3. Now this is the time that grub displays a list of all operating system installed and wait for some time until it boots the default kernel with default command line arguments. You must have seen once you uh, boot your system you, you see a screen which allows you to select one of the operating system in, in case if you have a dual boot. And this screen comes from a file inside forward slash boot forward slash grub grub.cfg. So boot inside boot partition inside grub subdirectory and within grub subdirectory there is a file grub.cfg. Let me less grub.cfg. So this is uh, the file uh, whose contents you normally see once you boot your system and it is shown to you over there. Whenever you want to uh, make changes in, 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 in this file, it is recommended that you, you don't change this file, or rather you change the configuration file that resides in at C default in grub. So this is the location of the file which you need to change if you want to. So if you change this file run update grub afterwards to update this file as well. So uh, what I want to change right now is the grub timeout. Uh, I just say uh, make it 30. So uh, now the screen will come up uh, for 30 seconds. If you see this file it has uh, a lot of uh, options available but right now let me stay over here and finally I need to do update uh, hyphen grub to uh, make the changes of this file permanent. This generate the file again and it found this file vm9s initial rhyme disk the vm9s for 4.3 initial rhyme disk for that and that is done okay. So now this is the time that grub displays uh, the list and that list will be now displayed for, for 30 seconds. So let me uh, let me do reboot. And to reboot uh, what I what I need to do is I need to do system control reboot as well as CEM CTL reboot. But before I do this and check out whether the 30 second change has been implemented let me briefly talk about the boot time parameters that can be passed to Linux kernel. Right students, you must have uh, written C programs in which you pass those C programs, the main function of that C program, a command line argument, and based on that command line argument, its behavior is changed. Similarly, you can pass command line arguments to your Linux kernel. Let me do man boot uh, parameter. Okay, so instruction to boot time parameters to the Linux kernel. Linux kernel accepts certain command line arguments or boot time parameters at the moment it started. Please read this. A lot of parameters. Uh, let me let me talk about some of the important like in it. So this is uh, the initial parameter. Uh, the default setting for this init is has been in it, uh, but. Uh, to the boot time, boot, but to the boot system without a root password. If you want to boot in without a root password, you can give uh, uh, bin sh or sbin bash argument to this init. If you pass this to this init, uh, the system will lock you in as root without asking you for the password. Okay, uh, then there are other, uh, okay, root. So this uh, tells the kernel what device to be used as the root file system while booting. And the default is normally forward slash div forward slash SDA. You, you can see the details over here. Okay, then we have, okay, this is important. RO or RW. The RO option tells the kernel to mount the root file system as read only. This is done so that the FSCK program, which we have talked about in a previous session, can check and repair the Linux file system. And normally the default is RW, that is read write. And then we have, uh, we have, okay, panic. 
by default the kernel do not reboot after a panic but this option causes the kernel to reboot after after this much amount of seconds n seconds okay then we have the reboot warm cold bios or hard we can give these two options cold is the default and over here hard is the default then then we can always pass uh, this debug argument this argument will cause the kernel to also print messages logged at uh, the kern debug level now after having a fair idea of the command line parameters a bit of ideas that can be passed to the kernel let us try a system reboot let me do a system ctl reboot okay so the system will uh, reboot and soon you will see the file that we have changed will come in action and you can you can you can see it will make the file stay for 30 seconds you you can see the count over here 27 seconds 26 seconds 25 this is because we have changed it from 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 uh, 10 to probably 30 seconds now if you want to pass command line arguments to the linux kernel you need to press e E to edit command so we press E first of all you need to press the kernel if you have more than one operating system I press E and now I I find out where is my Linux kernel and uh, and over here yes if you can see uh, my cursor is right on on this Linux um, the boot VM Linus 4.6 this is a kernel which is going to boot and the first argument is root RWT which we just talked about and it it points to the UUID of, of my hard disk. Then we have RO and then we have in initial uh, RAM disk. Then we have this argument quite. And after this, I can put a space and I, I, I can say INIT in it uh, is equal to forward slash uh, bin forward slash bash. So if I press enter now, uh, the system will take me to uh, a bash shell without uh, asking me any password. I can uh, give a particular run level over here and instead of going into the, uh, the graphical user interface I can use on to I can go to the uh, command line interface by giving by giving the appropriate argument over here. So I, I just don't give any arguments. I press control X and now the system will start rebooting so by the time our system reboots uh, let's move on uh, to to our board over here and start talking about this again so now remember the screen has been displayed and we have selected the kernel and the kernel is now trying to trying to trying to boot and this stage is known as the kernel initialization. Uh, now students, after having seen uh, the different stages of bootloader, starting from the 446 bytes of code in the MBR and then stage uh, 1.5 grub bootloader, uh, and which locates the kernel image and uncompress it. Uh, now this is the kernel initialization phase. We call this uh, stage kernel initialization because the kernel is now loaded into memory. Let me keep writing the steps now. The kernel that we have just seen, the VM liners, is uncompressed and loaded into memory. Now, now the kernel initializes itself after being loaded. It initializes itself, it accesses the keyboard, monitor, disk controller, timers, and it, it sets up the interrupt handling mechanism as well. Now students, uh, the Linux kernel needs to mount the root file system. So this kernel needs to mount the root file system forward slash which is on a partition 
that may be having the capabilities of like uh, uh, logical volume management maybe software raid is implemented on it maybe it is on a network file system but unfortunately these features these features are not compiled into the linux kernel rather they are present as uh, loadable kernel modules in in forward slash lib forward slash modules directory and this directory is present on the root file system itself now the question is let me change color now the question is how the Linux kernel access the notable kernel modules that are required for mounting the root file system located in lib modules which are present on the root file system itself so this is the biggest question and the solution is let me come back to black color and the solution is forward slash boot forward slash init rd dot img so initial ram disk image file so what happens is this file is loaded first uncompressed and then it is loaded This initial RAM disk contains directories and files like uh, the for slash bin, dev, lib, and so on, which mirror the real or permanent file system. Uh, let me show you this on, on, on the terminal. Let me show you this. So this has been started and we can see, we can see this, the contents of initial RAM disk, which are located in the boot directory over here. So here we are on, on, on the terminal again. Let me okay, so let me uh, B root uh, SU hyphen so that it should not give me any. Okay, now I need to see the init rd dot image file, and I use the command uh, ls init init ram fs, and I give init rd dot image four point six. Let's suppose, and I write this in 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 my home directory. Let's suppose with the name of my init rd image dot txt. Suppose. So uh, the contents of this are written over here, and now let me do ls in present working in my home directory my init rd image dot text file. So you can see over here the entire uh, file system, the entire file system, all the etc files, the lib directory, uh, the lib64 file, a lot of directories and files, and they're all there. So. Uh, what I just wanted to say is that this init rd dot image is a temporary file system that contains all those loadable kernel modules that are required to load the actual file system. So let me uh, write it down over here that the contents of init rd file serves as temporary root file system 
and helps the kernel to boot properly and load all the LKMs required to mount the actual root file system, be it on uh, LVM or, or, or RAID partition or maybe on NFS. Finally, uh, the kernel executes a command that is called pivot underscore root. So the kernel executes this command, uh, just basically alters the root partition from init rt to forward slash. This removes the initial RAM disk file system from the memory and establishes the permanent file system inside the memory. So once the file system is there, kernel then initializes the scheduler with the PID of zero, also called the swapper process. And it finally then forks and executes uh, the, the forward slash s bin forward slash init process. And maybe in newer systems, forward slash bin system d program. And actually both of these programs are these days a soft link to forward slash lib forward slash system d forward slash system d now this system daemon this system d process is basically responsible for initializing and establishing all other user space processes after doing uh, initializing or forking this system daemon the kernel itself moves to the background and waiting to be called by other processes so with this the kernel initialization phase is over and we move on to to the system daemon or the init process now after the kernel has gone to the background and the control is there with the system daemon previously known as uh, uh, the init process which is also called the granddaddy of all Linux user space processes remember gentlemen in older Linux distribution older Linux distro uh, like Ubuntu 14 Debian 6 Red Hat Enterprise uh, Linux 6 and CentOS 6, they all use init. They all use init. During booting process, the main task of System 5 init daemon was to start different processes by executing different scripts as per the default run level mentioned in the file at C init tab. But since uh, in, in newer Linux distributions like Ubuntu 15.04, Debian 7, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7, and CentOS 7, they, they are using now the system D. They, they are using what we call system D1. The system daemon has many advantages uh, and right now uh, the one of our interest is fast booting. It performs fast booting. In system 5 uh, way of booting you do not see the login prompt until all the services required for a particular run level are up and running. So for init over here In the previous way, system 5 in it, the login prompt is not displayed until all the services that are required for a particular run level are up and running. On the contrary, in case of system D, which is used these days, the prompt is shown within a couple of seconds. No matter if a service is, uh, uh, if a service on a remote socket is not available, which is actually, which actually makes sense, of course. So, uh, if we talk about uh, 
the system 5 there are seven run levels starting from 0 1 2 3 4 5 and 6 0 is the power off 1 is the rescue this is the run level which you normally use when there are issues with the system and you want to repair it then we have multi-user number two and this multi-user is uh, without the support of networking three is also multi-user and this is with the support of all the tcp ip stack four was unused five was the graphical and six is the reboot this was system five in it seven different run levels and 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 system d we normally call the run levels as the targets and we have different targets like power of dot target we have rescue dot target we have multi user dot target for two for three and for four then we have graphical dot target and then we have uh, finally reboot dot target uh, okay so uh, before I before I actually move ahead and start describing these let's move on to a terminal and let's see certain files over here let me do ls at c okay so inside the forward slash at c directory you have different directories rc0.t rc1.t 2 3 4 5 and rc 6.t these uh, seven different directories contains some startup scripts having names starting with ns let me move on to rc5.t and let me do ls of that you can see certain script files over here uh, certain files with names starting with s and certain files with names starting with k so these are the startup scripts and these are the kill scripts they are executed in the same sequence in which these numbering are seen by you for example since this is rc5.t you can see s05 gdm3 uh, genome display manager so this is a script that deals with the genome display manager and, and and these are basically soft links to to files that resides in at c init.t directory and after uh, the init process has executed all these scripts uh, it displays a, a, a user interface to to the user to use the operating system and the hardware this was what used to happen in system 5 init way of initialization but now in all modern linux distribution the init daemon is replaced by by the system daemon so uh, as far as the system daemon is concerned i personally believe that we have conducted a session on this and if you have gone through that session then you must be knowing that uh, there is a command that is system ctl that is used to uh, that is used to display different unit types to you and in the different unit types like service socket pass name the the unit type which I'm interested right now is the target. The system control is a command that is used to introspect and control the state of the system daemon. And this command is used to display all the possible unit types that are available on your system. And the target unit file actually represents the state of the system at any one time. Target unit file uh, are different from other unit files 
like service and socket because service unit file represent a specific resource while a target unit group other units together to represent the state of the system at any instant of time. So as we have seen over here, uh, the target unit represents the state of the system, multi-user.target, graphical.target, power of dot target. So uh, let me let me show you the different target files that are there in clear in forward slash lib system d and inside system d we have system and inside system we have a lot of files these are a lot of service files and target files and so on but right now i'm just interested in the target files so let me put an aesthetic and let me find out just the target files so you can see the target files over here so these are the different target files that you can see a lot of target files right now i'm interested only in those target files which deal with the run level so let me say run level strike okay so uh, you can see we have run level 0 dot target we have run level 1 dot target 2 dot target 3 dot target 4 5 and 6 dot target so these are different uh, target files and these target files can be achieved by different other files or or services which uh, are mentioned in in these directories wants run level 1 dot target dot wants okay so uh, right now we are interested in, in, in these target files and I'm sure that you by now must be having a fair understanding of the correspondence between uh, the system 5 run levels and the system D targets. We can see uh, how the run level uh, 5, the graphical run level is mapped onto the graphical dot target. So to bring the system in graphical dot target state, different services must be running. Uh, to bring the system in this state, different services must be running. So let me let me give a command. System CTL list dependencies of graphical dot target. List dependencies of graphical dot target. So so graphical dot target depends on a lot of services like it depends on these services then it depends on the multi-user target and the multi-user target depends on a lot of services which must be running to come on to this target and then multi-user target depends on basic dot target you can see and the basic dot target depends on slices dot target and uh, the basic dot target also depends on sockets dot target and so on so let me let me write the command something like this. Let me just grab targets. So now this is a, a shrinked view. So graphical dot target depends on multi user dot target, which depends on basic dot target, getty dot target, and remote fs dot target. Basic dot target depends on paths, slices, sockets, and sys init dot target. And sys init dot target depends on these three targets. So now uh, these are the different target files and whenever you want to come on to the multi-user target that means the system must try to achieve first these targets and then it should enter multi-user target and if you want to come in the graphical target the system must first achieve all these targets including the multi-user target to come in the graphical target. So uh, in order if you want to check uh, what is the current default target or the state of the system you can always do systemctl get hyphen default so it tells you that you are in the this target and if you want to change you can use uh, systemctl set default and suppose you can write down over here uh, multi user dot target so it will change you to uh, the default setting to the multi-user target. 
So, gentlemen, uh, uh, after the target is achieved, uh, all the appropriate appropriate processes are up and running, uh, and also a uh, user interface is given to you using which you can interact with your hardware. So, this is uh, what the uh, the entire uh, booting process is is about. So, if I if I just give you an overview again for for better understanding. let me let me come up over here okay so uh, we have talked about uh, the bios which perform the post and the complementary uh, uh, metal oxide semiconductor which contains uh, the the priority of uh, the booting devices to uh, select the master boot record uh, this is done over here and then after this is done we move on to actual master boot record of the booting device that is the zero sector and that contains the stage one bootloader then we move on to to the other parts of the bootloader that is the grub2 grand unified bootloader which is the default of the linux and that is basically responsible for loading the linux kernel into memory using the stage 1.5 and stage 2 then when once the kernel is loaded into memory it initializes itself loads the initial ram disk image containing the temporary file system with different lkms that are used to load the actual file system then the kernel forks the uh, system d daemon system daemon instead of the system 5 init process the la latest linux distribution use system daemon which is the granddaddy of all user space processes as i've already said once this system daemon is up and running, it executes different processes and scripts to bring the system in, in the uh, default state, uh, which is normally the graphical dot target in today's distributions, and uh, thus finally giving a user interface to the user of the computer to interact with it. So, gentlemen, uh, I, I've tried to uh, briefly describe the booting process and system initialization uh, for for Intel 8086 processor with, uh, with the Linux operating system. Hope it was informative. I wish you all the best. Happy learning.